I recently ran into a situation in JavaScript where I had a number of units of work that I wanted to complete. And I wanted to, of course, use promises for that. However, I wanted to make sure that I only ever had up to n number of promises running at a time. So maybe I had like, say, 12 units of work, and I wanted to make sure that I only had three promises running at a time. Let's take a look at what we have with the JavaScript API first. Of course, promise.all is pretty common. This just takes an array of promises and returns the fulfilled values for all of those promises. Of course, the big gotcha with promise.all is that if any of those promises reject, your overall promise rejects and you don't get any of your values back. And so that's where promise.all settled comes into play. It will take an array of promises again, and it will always return an array of results. And it is, when I say results, it's not just the fulfilled result of the promise, because what if the promise rejects, right? But it is more similar to like a functional result type. I think this is pretty cool. You can see the return value is a set of objects that have a status, which is either fulfilled or rejected. And then if the status is fulfilled, we have a value. And if the status is rejected, we have a reason. So you can see in the example here, we get an array back that looks something like this, which is very much like a result type. Here's what I want to do. I want to create a new function that allows allows you to map a, a set of arguments into a function that returns a promise and we will limit the concurrency. So you can pass in say three and make sure that we're only ever executing three of these things at a time. And we won't be able to use all or all settled, but we will be able to use an experimental feature of node 21, which is a something new for the promise API promise dot with resolvers with resolvers returns what often is called a deferred object. The idea is that it returns an object that has a promise and a resolver and a rejector. And and so basically it kind of inverts the typical new promise syntax to give you access to the resolve and the reject outside of the promise itself. So we're going to create a function here that's called map promises. This function is going to take three arguments. We're going to have a set of args, which is really an array of an array of args, right? We want to be able to pass multiple sets of arguments that each becomes the arguments to a function that creates a promise, right? Well, that's going to be our second argument here. We can just call it callback, I guess. Obviously we expect it to to take whatever args we find inside this args array. And finally, let's create our third argument here, which is concurrency. So concurrency, of course, is going to be the number of promises that we want to be executing at a given time, the maximum number, I guess you could say. And callback here should return the promise that we want to execute. Now, map promise, of course, is going to need to return a promise of its own, right? A promise of the array of results that we get back. So we want to be able to, at the bottom here, do something like return promise. So where does that promise come from? Well, well, that is where with resolvers comes into play. So we can do promise dot with resolvers, and this is going to return us an object that has a promise and also a resolve function. Now, of course, it would also have a reject function, but because we're always going to return successfully here, even if some of our promises reject, uh, we don't need to destructure that. Seems like we need a place to track the results, right? So let's create a results array. And now we need a way to create a promise by combining one of the elements of args with our callback here, get that promise back and let it run. The challenge here is a little bit interesting, right? Because we want to create a promise that once it completes, it stores its result in the the results array. And if there are still arguments left on our args queue, then it should trigger the next one, right? So I think what we want is a function that we could call next. And we're going to put that inside of this. And next is something we could call that can do a couple of things, right? There are three behaviors that we need to trigger from within next. The first one is if there are still args, right? If there are still args left, create our next promise. The second one is if no args remaining and no pending promises, then we need to resolve uh, results. The last case is no args, but pending promises. So there's nothing to start, but there is something that's still running. And in that case, I think that's a no op. There's nothing really to do there, but wait for the pending promises to finish, right? Now, remember, if there are pending promises, at the end of those promises, when they have resolved, we want them to call next. And so we can do nothing in situation three here because eventually the last promise will finish. And at that point, situation two here will be true. No remaining args and no pending promises. And so we will resolve. So let's go ahead and set up uh, an if statement that manages these three situations. So the first one is if there are still args, we probably don't want to mutate this args array. So maybe what we need is a cursor to help us walk our way through the args. And then we can say if cursor is less than args dot length, there are still args. So then we have an else if here, the else if is there are no args remaining and there are no pending promises. 
right? Well, we already know if we get to this else that there are no args remaining because at that point cursor will be equal to args.length. Cursor's reached the end of the args and so there are no promises left to create. The next question then is just, are there pending promises? Well, when a promise resolves, it should push its result into the results array. So we know there are pending promises, or better yet, we know there are no pending promises when args.length is equal to results.length. And in that case, we know exactly what we need to do here. We just need to resolve results. The final case, there's nothing to do here. So maybe we just leave a comment. We have our next function written here. The main thing that we need to fill in here is if we still have args, then we need to actually create that next promise. So we'll get into that in just a second. But where do we call this next function? Well, we will call it somewhere in here, right? We know that. We know once this promise resolves, we should call next again. We also need to kick off our work by calling next concurrency number of times. We can do uh, while concurrency minus minus and call next. So that really is all we need to do to kick things off. Concurrency number of times we will call next. We've kind of done all of the structural pieces around actually creating the promises. So let's finally get into that. We first of course need an index, right? We need to be able to know which promise in our array of args and our array of results we're working with. So let's create our index here, which is just going to be the same as cursor, but then we'll use this opportunity to increment cursor as well. We'll maybe get our callback args here, which is just going to be args at index. And then we need to create our promise callback and pass it CB args. There is our promise. Now, crucially, we don't want to put a wait here. Obviously, we would then need to turn this to an async function or something like that. But the main reason we don't want to is because we want P to be a reference to the promise. We don't want to reference the value that this promise resolves to because we need to put a, a then and a catch on this promise. So let's do promise dot then. And of course, we're going to get a value here. And if we get a value out of this promise, then let's do results at index equals, and let's create a result value that looks very similar, in fact, in fact identical to what we get um, to what we get in promise all settled. So let's take a look at this again. What we get is, let me just copy this example, status fulfilled and value. Nice. Now let's add a catch. What happens if there's a reason that this uh, fails? Instead of a status of fulfilled and a value, we're gonna put a reason and our status is going to be rejected. So results is gonna be an array of either status fulfilled with values or status rejected with reasons. Okay, now there's one more thing we want to do here. So I'm gonna add another then clause to this promise chain. Now remember, this then will execute after either this then or this catch. This catch is going to kind of handle the error, but then return a promise of its own. So this then will get called no matter which branch we take here, either the first then or this catch will then resolve to this then. I guess in this situation, we could also use finally, which kind of runs whether it's a then or a catch. Um, I don't really know if there's a difference here between using finally or using then. Really, the only thing we need to do in all of these is call next. However, we don't want to just call next like this. I don't think we want the call stack for next to be bound inside of the previous one. What we can do is instead call set immediate and we can pass next in there. And this is kind of like a set timeout with a timeout of zero. The idea is this just kind of enqueuing this function to be run as soon as possible, but not binding it to this specific promise. And I think what we have now should be a working version of promise creation and concurrency. Let's run through this one more time. Our next function handles three situations. Let's go from bottom to top. In the case where there is no promises left to begin, but promises that still have to finish, we're just gonna hang out. In the case where all of our promises have finished, we can return the results by calling resolve. And finally, in the case where there are new promises yet to be created, we can create that promise. We can set up handlers for the success state. We can set up a handler for the error state, and then we can set up a final handler that will trigger the next promise in the queue to be created. Let's create a situation where we can use this. I guess the simplest thing really is to, to do some math. So let's create our args array here, and then let's do a good old fashioned for loop args.push, and we'll push in um, I notice I'm putting I in an array. And so now let's create our callback. Of course, we need this to be asynchronous so we can return a new promise here and let's do set timeout. We want these to kind of execute slowly. Let's do console.log start. 
so we kind of get an idea when this function starts and we're going to start with our number and then let's also do an end with our number and in between those we will do a resolve number times number um, this is uh the the world's most uh intense get square function i guess but we have a promise we're going to create some kind of delay um, by adding a timeout here and then we'll just resolve the square and we have some logging to kind of show us our logic in action oh let's do one more thing actually if the number mod three is zero then instead let's reject so now let's actually run this await map promises we'll pass it args we'll pass it get square and we'll go with the default of three we have our result back here console.log our result cool now i think we have to do this um using node 21 21.6.1 21 to be as specific as possible and to get the with resolver uh, functionality we need to use this js promise with resolver because it's behind this experimental flag and finally let's call map promises js and let's see what happens uh oh <laughs> okay that's a good point we should actually pull out our reject function here okay that's good so let's see Oh, something is wrong. Something's wrong with either our, our map promises function or our example. Okay, the result is what we would expect, right? Zero, uh, zero, three, six, etc. We rejected. Um, one is squared, two is squared, four is squared, five is squared, etc. But this start and end logging is is not what I would expect. Um, because I did it wrong. I did the start and end logic wrong. I think what we need to do is move this start outside of the set timeout because this is when the promise is created. Sorry about that. Yeah, we need to move start outside the timeout, <laughs> right? And then end happens at the end of the timeout, right? No wonder they were happening right beside each other. Okay, let's run this again and see what this looks like. Okay, this is more what I would expect. So immediately we see our concurrency is in play. We start zero, one, and two. When zero ends, three starts. When one ends, four starts. When two ends, five starts. This is working just fine. We can see that we get these results back. Our concurrency is working just as we would expect. This is our map promises function that gives us some concurrency uh, with JavaScript promises. So obviously there are promise libraries that have this and a lot of other utilities built in, but it's always fun, I think, to figure out how to do these things for yourself. I'm going to end this with a question for you guys. Is this the type of video you guys want to see on this channel? Do you prefer more of the TypeScript stuff that I have done in the past? Something more like this, something different entirely. I don't know. Let me know in the comments what you guys find interesting. And hopefully there's an overlap between what you guys would like to see and the types of content I would like to create. And if that's the case, then you'll see more on this channel in the future. So thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one.